Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all my work on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. From a book called The Cloister Walk by Kathleen Norris. We hear the words of Jerome today as morning prayer, a section of the prologue to his commentary on Isaiah. He was a contentious man. Ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, he booms, and his words shatter our sleepy silence. Jerome was the hard-edged, brilliant fellow who first translated the Hebrew scriptures into Latin. In studying and judging from his letters and his life, he may have been one of the most irrational people who ever lived. Jerome is a saint feminists love to hate and to quote, now that a virgin has conceived in the womb and born to us a child, now the chain of the curse is broken. Death came through Eve, but life has come through Mary, and thus the gift of virginity has been bestowed most richly upon women, seeing that it has had its beginning from a woman. This is typical of the way in which the Christian biblical interpreters of the late 4th century, Jerome and then Augustine, not long after, made a connection between Eve and Mary. We've lost the wonder that these words must have had for those who first heard them. Now we sigh, discouraged, hearing only the seeds of our well-worn, ludicrous sexual double standard that dictates that women must either be virgins or whores, either blessed or cursed, while men are simply sexual athletes, slaves of lust. And don't forget, Christian boys and girls, everyone is a temple of the Holy Spirit. As with most of these writings from a time so distant from our own, it is difficult to read without reading into our into it are modern frustrations, difficult to discern the complexities that resist our simplistic interpretations. To me, this passage reflects a fear of women that is thoroughly comprehensible. If Eve is the mother of living, she is also the mother of the dead. One of the most astonishing and precious things about motherhood is the brave way in which women consent to give birth to creatures who will one day die. That they do this is an awesome thing, as is their virginity, their existence in and of themselves, apart from the potential for bearing life and death. That we all begin inside a woman and must emerge from her body is something that the male theologians of the world's religions have yet to forgive us for. The truth about Jerome is that he was an equal opportunity commungeon. He despised both men and women, but women fascinated him more. Maybe because he genuinely believed that in them, as in Mary, lay the beginnings of salvation. Jerome's friendships with women, Paula, her daughter, her daughter Estrucon, Marcella, certainly saved him from much hardship. These learned, powerful women had taken their considerable wealth out of the Roman Empire's reach in order to found monasteries and scholarly enterprises such as Jerome's. Without their friendship and financial support, his translation of the Bible would not have been possible. It is clear from Jerome's correspondence that his friendships with these women were abiding and deep. I like to think that they inspired him to give the women of the New Testament a theological import that is radical even now. Whenever I hear of conservative seminarians, Roman Catholic or Protestant, who bristle at the mention of Mary Magdalene as a model for the apostles, I think of Jerome's typically tart comment on the subject. The unbelieving reader may perhaps laugh at me for dwelling so long on the praises of mere women. 
Yet if he will but remember how holy women followed our Lord and Savior and ministered to him out of their substance, then how the three Marys stood before the cross, and especially how Mary Magdalene called the tower from the earnestness and glow of her faith, was privileged to see the rising Christ first of all before the very apostles. He will convict himself of pride sooner than, than me of folly. For we judge people's virtues not by their sex, but by their character. Jerome's own character was notoriously difficult. As Peter Brown has dry, dryly noted, he was a man of pronounced aesthetical views. Not at all shy about advising his lady friends on the virtues of going without baths, of aspiring to holy knees hardened by, like a camel's from the frequency of prayers, and of sleeping on cold floors full of groans and tears. Who wouldn't cry? The hymn we sing in Jerome's honor is a pleasant, genetic, generic hymn of praise of the saints entitled, Who Are These Like Stars Appearing? And it amuses me greatly to envision Jerome of all people shining like a star and hating every minute of it. As we're leaving the church, I mention this to one of the monks. Ah, poor Jerome, he said, forced to smile and sing for all eternity. Maybe that's his punishment. One of the theology students has overheard us. The Feast of St. Jerome's, he said, wickedness is in the air. Parker J. Palmer says in his book, The Active Life, if we are to understand the paradox of contemplation and action, we must attend to what Thomas Merton called the hidden wholeness that lies beneath the broken surface of our lives. Until we know the hidden wholeness, we will live in a world of dualisms, of forced but false choices between being and doing that result in action that is merely frenzy or in contemplation that is mere escape. Our movement toward the hidden wholeness is not easily mapped because it is different for each person and always a mystery. But I can at least suggest the general direction of that movement, which is downward, contrary to the upward imagery of which much Western spirituality with its fear of the fall. Annie Dillard has offered some words about downwardness, and about the hidden wholeness toward which it takes us that are full of insight for our exploration into contemplation and action. In the deeps are the violence and terror of which psychology has warned us. But if you ride these monsters deeper down, if you drop with them farther over the world's rim, you find that our sciences cannot locate or name the substrate the ocean, or matrix, or ether which buoys the rest, which gives goodness its power for good and evil its power for evil. The unified field, our complex and inexplicable explicable caring for one another and for our life together there. This is given, it is not learned. With Thomas Merton, Dillard knows that there is a unity behind diversity, a wholeness behind the divergent forces of life. We find this wholeness, she says, not in an upward sweep to abstraction, but in a downward plunge to the depths. This image of the spiritual quest is challenging, even frightening, in a culture that seeks wholeness in atmospheric generalities rather than in the subterranean stuff. But I believe that the culture is wrong and that Dillard is right. We will face the hidden wholeness on which contemplation and action depends only if we are willing to go down and into our lives, not up and out of them as we are sometimes urged to do. Dillard also departs from convention by insisting that the hidden substrate of our lives does not conform to normal standards of goodness. It gives goodness its power for good, but also gives evil its power for evil. 
Here is an even more challenging, more frightening notion in a culture that puts good and evil in airtight compartments, picturing them as antithetical impulses. Again, I believe Dillard is wiser than the culture. When we plumb the depths of full aliveness, we draw near to the source that empowers all else. And in that power, there is not only grace, but danger. Not only healing, but wounding. Not only life, but death. Dillard is saying neither more than less, nor less than the prophet Isaiah. I am Yahweh, unrivaled. I form the light and create the dark. I make good fortune and create calamity. It is I, Yahweh, who do all this. When we meet the spirit that gives life, we encounter all the powers, including death, and we cannot be selective. In fact, if Dillard is right, the clue to full aliveness is found in the very forces of calamity that we would avoid if we had the power to choose. Speaking of the monsters we will meet on our journey downward, she urges us to ride these monsters deeper down. Once more, she upsets the conventional wisdom that warns us to flee from monsters lest we lose our lives. On the contrary, Deary Dillard suggests those monsters are the only reliable guides to the deeper reaches of our lives. Only by riding them down, despite the risks, will we be able to find the primal source of ourselves and our world. Doing so, of course, requires a radical change of perspective for many of us. We must abandon the common sense notion that the monsters we meet within ourselves are enemies to be destroyed. Instead, we must cultivate the hope that they can become companions to be embraced, guides to be followed, albeit with caution and respect. For only our monsters know the way down to that inner place of unity and wholeness. Only these creatures of the night know how to travel where there is no light. Though this change in perspective is radical, it contains a common sense of its own. The non-monstrous parts of ourselves, the parts we consider angelic, are parts that separate us from others. They make for distinction, not unity. These parts give us pride because they make us different, not because they unite us with the common lot of humankind. Our successes and our glories are not the stuff of community, but our sins and our failures are. In those difficult areas of our lives, we confront the human condition, and we begin to learn compassion for all beings who share the limits of life itself. It is not the angels in us, but the fallen angels who know the way down, down to the hidden wholeness. From Mary Oliver's collection of poems in the book Devotions. Lagos. Why wonder about the loaves and the fishes? If you say the right words, the wine expands. If you say them with love and the felt ferocity of that love and the felt necessity of that love, the fish explode into many. Imagine him speaking, and don't worry about what is reality, or what is plain, or what is mysterious. If you were there, it was all those things. If you can imagine it, it is all those things. Eat, drink, be happy, accept the miracle, accept too each spoken word spoken with love.